Primeiramente, agradecer à comissão pelo convite e vamos dar início à, à sessão. Convidar, é, chamar o doutor Nicolas, Nicolas Morrison, para falar sobre prevenção de restenose após angioplastia femoral superficial. Yeah, I know, but... All right, good. Well, we'll, we'll just start. Uh, I'm going to talk about the <coughs> prevention at this point of restenosis after percutaneous treatment of superficial femoral artery disease. So what's the major problem? We all know that neointimal hyperplasia, which is the re body's response to injury, and it happens as soon as the artery is intervened on, as soon as it is injured. And it's really the leading cause of failure for any revascularization anywhere in the body, whether it be open with bypass or percutaneous. And I borrowed this picture from a uh, gentleman named Giancarlo Biamino, who demonstrated very elegantly how the different areas of the body suffer from restenosis. And you'll note that the superficial femoral artery is probably the area where restenosis is most severe and most problematic. So the question that I ask, and I've been asking since I've been in this field for the last 10 or 11 years, is, is anything that's new better than what we actually already have? And I think up until this point, the answer has been no. And I show you these different atherectomy devices that have come along in the United States in the past couple of years, which have, we've sort of been bombarded with these uh, devices which are really one after the other, not one of them shows a significant improvement over simple balloon angioplasty. And yet we have a barrage of uh, devices which you know, really have no benefit and yet they're being approved uh, at lightning speed. So I'll talk to you very briefly about our experience at our institution, New York Presbyterian Hospital in, in Manhattan. It's the hospital for Columbia University and Cornell University. And this is our presentation about three years ago of 1,000 percutaneous interventions. 46% of our patients were claudicants, 53% limb threat. And this is just to kind of give you a baseline of what we have with all interventions that we performed in all beds. Two-year primary patency of around 62% and secondary patency of 79% at two years. So um, this is kind of gives you a baseline in terms of what we're dealing with and what the real world experience is. I think most people would agree that's kind of what we see uh, with uh, currently available devices. But I looked at a subset of my patients, and some of you that were there last night remember me discussing this, a subset of my patients who had undergone heart transplantation and who were on chronic immunosuppression. And so I happened to come across, we have about 11 or 1,200 patients at our institution who have had heart transplants. And about 35 to now, it's up to about 40 patients we treated for uh, claudication. Now, these patients had claudication that was severe enough to limit their lifestyle. And in, in this particular series, 33 out of 34 cases, we performed angioplasty and stenting. In one case, we did an atherectomy on the SFA. We, all these patients were on a very similar regimen of chronic immunosuppression. And I'll just show you that in our population, 100% of the patients were free from claudication at 26 months mean follow-up. And now the follow-up is up to about five or six years. Our primary patency at 26 months was 97%. And our secondary patency at 26 months mean was 100% with one patient having a very focal restenosis within one of the stents. And I found that this was fairly remarkable to see this primary patency in 33 patients who had stents and one patient with an atherectomy. And I believe that it was based on their uh, chronic immunosuppressive therapy because of their transplant, which is what got me interested in the idea of drug-coated stents in the femoral arteries in terms of uh, preventing restenosis. So we know that there are different uh, pharmacologic agents that are available. There are immunosuppressant-type meds, which we see in the transplant population, and also chemotherapeutic agents like paclitaxel. And there are different stent platforms. In the coronary is obviously the balloon expandable, which we know from our uh, uh, basic bare metal stent experience in the lower extremity, balloon expandable is inferior to uh, self-expanding. And down the road, there's been some experimentation on absorbable stents, and I believe that in the future there may be a role for that. So I'll briefly, briefly talk about the Sirocco trial, which I think most of us f are familiar with in Europe. It was a randomized double-blinded study looking at patients with SFA stenosis. It was a smart stent from Cordis with Sirolimus uh, embedded on it, and the patients were followed for six months and then two years, and they were followed for symptoms, uh, ABI, and also for patency. 93 patients, 
And at 24 months, the restenosis rates were the same, whether they had a bare metal stent or a serolimus eluting stent, which was kind of disappointing in terms of the, the long-term results. And this is a typical case that we've all seen many times, the restenosis in those long SFA stents. And if you look at the secondary analysis of Sirocco 2, there was really no significant improvement with the, with the serolimus eluting stent at six months. And one of the big problems with this study was that there was a fair number of stent fractures, which really limited the ability to, do, uh, to uh, treat these patients because the stent fractures resulted in clinically significant events in a number of patients. And I put this up there because there have been some folks who've done a lot of work in the infrapopliteal region. And I put this up largely because I don't know what your practice is in Latin America, but to see 58 patients having 131 infrapopliteal stents to me is, is astonishing. And I can tell you that in 10 years, I think I've put two stents below the popliteal in several hundred cases. So I'm a little bit concerned about this study. However, they had really good angiographic follow-up at one year. And they did find that with serolimus in the infrapopliteal, the primary patency was 80% in those patients that had angiographic follow-up. And it was 41% in the bare metal stent. So interesting. So the same group reported no benefit for the paclitaxel in the cardiac uh, in the below knee. A PTX balloon, there was a study that was presented in the New England Journal of Medicine, which showed that with a, a paclitaxel eluting balloon, there was significant improvement in terms of restenosis at six months. And this is what sort of led to the enthusiasm. Um, I will show you a case where drug-eluting stents placed in the popliteal resulted in a very bad outcome, and these are coronary drug-eluting stents, which is why I've always cautioned against using these in patients. Uh, and so we'll talk very briefly about the 12-month uh, results for the Zilver PTX drug-eluting stent, which is really the state of the art at this point in terms of drug-coated uh, treatment in the lower extremity. Randomized control trial, prospective and multinational study, primary safety endpoints as you can see, primary effectiveness endpoint is patency, which is really what I want to focus on, and treat the femoral artery from the entire length. Uh, the patients were enrolled and, and divided based on uh, PTA versus Zilver PTX, and then they were sub, um, suboptimal PTA was then uh, divided into a bare stent or a drug-eluting stent. And the, if you look at the patient demographics and comorbidities, they were very similar. Lesion characteristics between the groups were essentially identical. And this, again, is how they were enrolled, 236 and 235. So looking at the results, the safety endpoint, 91% in the PTX arm versus 82%. And the safety was significantly better with the drug-coated stent. Very low stent fracture rate, less than 1%. Now looking at the primary patency, which I think is the most important thing, 83% primary patency out to 18 months versus 65% in the PTA arm, which is a significant difference between the two. Just showing you a typical case with a drug-coated stent with 12-month follow-up showing no significant restenosis. And intravascular ultrasound showing the same. So looking at the primary patency versus of a drug-coated stent versus a bare metal stent, 83% versus 67%, which is quite remarkable and statistically significant. So the drug effect, it really decreases the restenosis rate by about 63% at 12 months. So in conclusion, this is the largest prospective randomized trial of drug-coated stents, and we're going to talk more about it tomorrow, the 24-month data. And it shows really remarkable uh, results with respect to restenosis in the superficial femoral artery. And I thank you for attention. I apologize for going over for a few seconds. Thank you. <laughs>